Everyone, um, I'm Kyle Cleveland with Central University of Japan's Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies. And in our lecture series today, we have with us Greg Smith from Penn State University. Greg may well be the leading authority and scholar on earthquakes and particular earthquakes in Japan. In the English language, he's written a book called When the Earth Roars, which is the third, another book which he's talking about today on the size of Japan. If you go to the Asia Pacific Journal Japan Focus, he has an interesting essay that's um, kind of a truncated version of some of the issues he gets into in the books. He's also written on Okinawa, the Ritchie Kingdom in that history. And I feel very privileged to have him today. So Greg, thanks for taking the time. I know it's late night being there. Oh, you're welcome. And it's really a pleasure to be here. And uh... So let me go ahead now and uh, share my screen. See if this works. Uh, does that work? Okay. Uh, let me get organized now. So, okay. Okay, there we go. All right, uh, and let me put this up in. All right, does that look good? Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, um, now, um, the way I uh, sort of was, uh, I couldn't be sure exactly what's going to go on here. And so when I, I was thinking in terms of just a typical classroom session, uh, for example, I teach a course on earthquakes rather often. And so I'm, I wanted to start off with a series of questions that introduce some of the main concepts about earthquakes and seismicity, uh, because I've, I've noticed that, you know, these are not intuitive for most people. I mean, we, we think we know what earthquakes are, but actually, what exactly are they and what is exactly is seismic risk and how does it manifest itself? Um, you know, unless you have somewhat of a specialized knowledge, these things might not be so obvious. So, um, <clears throat> um, if you want, you can go give it a shot at, at answering these. Um, uh, and if not, I mean, or I could just answer them myself, but it'd be more interesting if you all would take a shot at a few answers. And so I, I put some hints in there. Um, now, obviously the question of what is science is immensely complicated, but if you were to answer it using the word patterns, what do you think uh, you might say? Does anyone want to give that a shot? Yeah. Uh, I, I may have to repeat the question. I'm not sure. Go ahead, Hunter. One of our students. I'm teaching a course called Risk Yeah. <laughs> but he was asking a question. Does anyone want to address that? Okay, Greg. So we don't have any questions yet. Okay. <laughs> well, um, a very simple and useful um, definition is the study of the natural world you know, as opposed to the supernatural or whatever, uh, in an effort to discern patterns. Uh, and um, with the additional sort of uh, idea that insofar as possible, we want to quantify those patterns. So, I mean, very simply stated, uh, and here is, is an example pertaining to earthquakes. So, for example, what is the probability that an earthquake is a foreshock to a larger earthquake. So you have an earthquake, and what's the possibility that that's either the main event or a foreshock to something even bigger or yeah, typically bigger. And so uh, here is a quote from the USGS website. Worldwide, the probability that an earthquake <clears throat> will be followed within three days by a large earthquake nearby is somewhere just over 6%. You know, so in other words, there's about a 94% chance that any earthquake will not be a foreshock, any earthquake. But in California, about half of the biggest earthquakes were preceded by foreshocks, and the other half were not. At this time, we cannot tell whether or not an earthquake is a foreshock until something larger happens after it. So we can only know in retro retrospect. So here's an example of several patterns, actually, uh, that have uh, that the U.S. Geological Survey states um, in its website, and what is the basis 
for this statement. And if you kind of think about it, there's no really way to measure this other than just observe earthquake sequences over and over and over again with all the tools we have and put all that data together and come up with these numbers. So very often the, the patterns that scientists um, discern are based on observation, typically uh, rigorous observation, if, it, if at all possible. Um, and this will come in when we look at the, the Japan case, over, you know, historically. Um, <clears throat> now, what is an earthquake? This is something that's remarkably difficult for my students to figure out. And it's maybe because I'm so poor at explaining it. But uh, if you and if you had to use the word energy in that, does anyone want to take a, a shot at that? When you have a big displacement of land that causes energy to be sent out in all directions in the form of like S waves and love waves and the like, and it caught the, the, which causes a lot of shaking and uh, yeah. Great. Really, right. no that, that, that covers uh, a lot of territory right there. So you have a displacement of earth, of land that um, uh, sends energy out in different directions and they take the form of different types of seismic waves. So the energy is, is embedded, is transmitted via those waves. Um, but there's one thing missing um, uh, or maybe a few, a few things and that is that, that release of what is required for that release of energy. So when you have the displacement of land, it has to happen rapidly. That's that's a, a crucial component, and the energy. Where does the from where does the energy come? Uh, the energy comes from built up stress uh, over time, such as on a slip fault or on really it can happen on faults. It can happen from like uh, injection of water into the ground that loosens up the dirt or bedrock or whatever. I uh, can come from, but mainly the big thing is the buildup of stress causing a slip. Greg, right, so if I can interject, I, I think it actually comes from a catfish. And <laughs> exactly. It's on the spine of a catfish and it shakes its tail. Um, that causes earthquake, right? Yeah, as long as the catfish shakes its tail fast and vigorously, then <laughs> that it'll work. <laughs> yeah. So you, wherever how you know you, we can we can propose uh, any number of um, mechanisms, but uh, uh, yeah. Oh, and I, I, I've just got the chat up now. I'm sorry, I didn't have that one activated. Uh, so here's one: the release of pent up energy when tectonic plates are rubbed against each other. So that's also an important uh, uh, feature. Uh, so yeah, rocks are elastic, and they build and they accumulate strain, and the strain comes from uh, the movement of tectonic plates, which is something we now know and have known since the late 60s and early 70s, but didn't know before that. And that's actually very important. Uh, and uh, these, so these tectonic plates are always moving. And, um, the, and this is actually part of the, the question down here, but uh, if we want, let's just go down the rabbit hole completely. We're almost uh, there. What ca causes those tectonic plates to move? And so they can move in a way like one would go under the other, they might move sideways, rub against each other, they might smash into each other. Uh, what's causing them to move? Isn't it the convection currents in the uh, Earth's mantle that is causing the plates to move or move away from each other? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's the only um, hypothesis that seems to have any plausibility is that it's convection currents of heat in the mantle. And so from what, and what is causing those convection currents? And then, we're, then we'll get to the, the total, the, the ultimate cause with the answer of that question. It's the, it's the, the heating and cooling of the uh, magma in the, in the mantle and it, heating while well, as it gets closer to the core and then because it heats up it rises and then comes back down as it cools down when it gets closer to the crust 
Okay, yeah, that's that's the mechanism, basic, you know, in, in a nutshell. But what's powering the mechanism? It's, it's actually really, in a sense, a very simple answer. All right, and it's the cooling of the Earth. So you know, the, the Earth is cooling. It's been cooling for billions of years, and we've got a few more billion to go. Uh, so ultimately, earthquakes are caused by the cooling of the Earth. Um, um, via a whole bunch of mechanisms of which uh, the movement of pl tectonic plates is, is particularly important. All right, great, yeah. All right, so um, <clears throat> so now uh, the next question I would typically ask, again, a little bit awkward in this format, but if it was a live class is, is what is a natural uh, hazard, right? And um, so, you know, people, students would typically come up with, uh, well, you know, wind, or you know, uh, uh, magma coming out of a volcano, or or something like that. All right. So out there in the world, there's all sorts of hazards that can, um, you know, but by definition, the word hazard means they can cause harm of some sort. Um, <clears throat> and the relevant hazard today, of course, is is seismicity. And from where does it come? We just went down that rabbit hole, and ultimately, I'm proposing that it comes from the cooling of the earth um, ultimately and then via a bunch of mechanisms of course all we could go beyond that and say where why is it, you know where did the earth come from and all that but let's not worry about that and then here's the crucial thing for that people often don't think about what is a natural disaster and right, so we we have a natural we have natural hazards out there including seismicity um, and seismicity being this potential for rocks to suddenly break uh, and release energy. Um, so does anyone want to give us a definition of a, of a natural disaster? All right, how about? No takers. No takers, yes. Yeah, so the intersection of natural hazards and the built environment or and or human society so we have natural hazards out there in the world and they come into contact or interact in some fashion with the societies that human beings have built you know our buildings our various kinds of infrastructure our communication systems we ourselves as people, you know, there's hazards that might kill us or injure us, et cetera. So it's that inner, it's that intersection. And uh, when the natural hazard comes in, a sufficiently severe natural hazard comes into contact with the built environment and interacts with it, we have the potential for a natural disaster. And uh, <clears throat> so with that in mind, let's consider uh, seismic risk. Um, and let me flip down two slides for that. Um, <clears throat> so here's just a very typical definition. You'll actually get a bunch of different possible definitions, but this one's very straightforward and is perfectly fine. Uh, potential economic, social, and environmental consequences of seismic hazards. And then this is somewhat important, which may occur within a specified period of time. Um, in, in other words, in practice, seismic um, risk is very often um, delimited within certain periods of time. So people say, what's the risk in the next 10 years of such and such, All right? Um, <clears throat> and what might be some of these consequences in, in, in concrete terms? Uh, so in other words, seismicity as it interacts with human society can, can do all sorts of things. It can cause severe ground motion, of various types of ground motion, which can shake down buildings. You know, that's the fairly obvious thing, uh, but it can have political consequences. It can generate tsunamis under certain conditions, as, and I'll, I'll explain how that works. Uh, it uh, can, and it, it can, you know, damage a nuclear power plant, uh, which then sets off a train of other kinds of, of consequences. Uh, <clears throat> It can kill people out, outright and indirectly. It can lead to famines, you know, etc. So uh, there are all sorts of direct and indirect consequences of uh, seismic hazards. 
And what about time periods? Um, is there any kind of relevant period of time that's important when talking about seismic um, risk? There's po several possible approaches here. Just think about that for a second, um, and then I'll come back to it in, in a little bit more concrete uh, or slightly more concrete examples. Um, and then very similar here, what is probabilistic risk assessment? This is, would be a way of assessing seismic risk or other risks. Let's see. Um, here is a definition from Wikipedia, so nothing fancy here, but <clears throat> is a systematic and comprehensive methodology to evaluate risks associated with a complex engineered technological entity, such as an airliner or a nuclear power plant, uh, or the effects of stressors on the environment. So for example, probabilistic environmental risk assessment. Um, risk in a PRA is defined as a feasible detrimental outcome of an activity or an action. You know, so what's possible harms? Um, in a PRA, risk is characterized by two quantities, the magnitude or severity of the possible adverse consequences and the likelihood of the occurrence. And then with respect to, um, to earthquakes, um, <clears throat> here's a couple of things to think about here. Is seismic risk constant? So in other words, is in a given, let's say in a given locality, is there the same seismic risk year after year after year? Is it, is it, you know, let's just put it, is it 10% to this year, 10% next year, 10% the next year? So is I'd, time? Always, I'd always heard that Japan runs on about a 70 year earthquake cycle. I guess that's for a major earthquake. So I would guess it's <laughs> episodic and periodic. Yeah, um, exactly. There, so there is roughly a 70 year, I mean, very, very roughly uh, a 70 year cycle in the sense of about every 70 years is going to be some kind of a big earthquake, although, again, very roughly. Um, and, and then, okay, so let's say that it's time dependent. And let's say that this year, the, uh, a big earthquake occurs in our locality. In Japan or, or anywhere. So, what's the likelihood that next year a big earthquake is going to occur in that locality? And you're, and you're probably all thinking, well, zero, right? Or very little, right? But you just sort of intuitively know that. And that's because of, of what an earthquake is it's the sudden release of accumulated strain. The strain might accumulate for 50, 100, or even 500 or more years. As those tectonic plates move three or seven or five centimeters, those are typical rates of movement of tectonic plates, you know, three, five, seven centimeters per year. Uh, the Pacific plate, for example, is about 3.5 centimeters. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so that's just a slow build up, build up, build up. And then there's that sudden release in an earthquake, not necessarily of all of that energy, but a, a lot of it. And so the chance of a of a similarly large earthquake occurring right after that is very small, almost negligible. Now there may be aftershocks and there probably will be. Uh, so time matters in that sense uh, uh, quite a lot. And there's also the sense of a recurrence interval. It's a little bit of a tricky idea because it's not, there's a tendency to oversimplify that and then use it to predict or forecast, but, but earthquakes do recur somewhat episodically so yeah most people would would regard seismic risk as being you know time dependent uh in a number of different ways and and, and um <clears throat> so what's the most common interval in probabilistic earthquake hazard maps in japan now that's a, a, a kind of a follow-on question but it's not necessarily the same question we just talked about in other words you know um do we use a 70 year interval, for example, 10 year interval, 100 year interval? Um, it turns out there's a, con there's a strong convention, the strong tendency in Japan and elsewhere to use a 30 year interval. Can you imagine why? Well, um, 
right? I would think it reaches a threshold of probabilistic possibility that at some point in time you can start worrying seriously. Um, actually, um, yeah, it's just arbitrary. Uh, people got together when in the first groups of folks who were making these these kind of maps thought, what would make what would be make sense to people? What might be useful to people? Should we do fifty years? It seems a little long. Ten years, a little short. Thirty years, it's almost a generation. It's an arbitrary figure. So some of these maps are are sometimes you'll see a fifty year interval, although thirty is by far the most common. Uh, so it's kind of an arbitrary uh, decision. I didn't realize that until I delved into the literature and 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 you know that including the the literature that's critical of this whole approach. And one of the criticisms is everything's arbitrary, even the time period. Well, anyway, you see here a a, a, a typical probabilistic earthquake hazard map from I believe 2012, uh, <clears throat> and um, the interval is 30 years, because uh, that seems about right. Um, the probability of the earth, the, the strength of the earthquake here, actually, I don't realize I didn't write on the, I didn't put that on the slide. I believe it's a magnitude six, it might be 6.5. I, I just don't remember, but typically these are six or 6.5, whether in Japan or elsewhere. Um, and so now you have the strong, the darker the color, so the darker red, and red for danger uh, is the greater probability that within this 30 year period, within any 30 year period, because you know, not just not from the fact that this was made in 2012 doesn't, it just means a 30 year period, um, <clears throat> that there will be, well, in this case, up to a 100% probability in the dark red of a magnitude six or maybe 6.5 earthquake occurring. Um, so you see areas that are, you know, are yellow and, and there the, the, the probability is 0% to 0.1%. So virtually zero within this 30 year period. There aren't too many of those. Then you have this orange where the probability goes up to 3%. Notice that the, all right, we go from 3% to 6%. In the, in the darker orange. So, okay, is that like, okay, we've doubled that. Um, then we go from 6% to 26% in the red, 26% to 100%. So, so you're noticing something about the scale is kind of arbitrary and just yeah, kind of fit things in there. Um, and so this, this, there's, a, there's a tremendous arbitrary quality to it. And then if you look at the location of all deadly earthquakes since 19, between 1980 and, and, and 2012, there might have been one more recently that I just haven't kept up with. Uh, deadly will define as 10 or more fatalities. So obviously some of them are way, way more than 10, like the 2011 event. But you notice where they fall, doesn't seem to have any particular relationship to the colors. Um, so what do you think just by looking what relationship attains between hazard probability and actual deadly earthquakes? So obviously to be deadly, an earthquake has to be a certain level of power. Magnitude six or more would typically, you know, be in the zone where it could be deadly. Yeah, and you're probably kind of wondering, not seeing a pattern here, except maybe the pattern is that it's random or it's not, you know, it's not connected to the colors. Um, so some critics of this have pointed out that, well, the colors actually correspond very nicely to how much money the government spends on earthquake related matters in which region. So uh, that's, you know, th that is a really close correlation. In fact, if I could rejigger the map to show that it would, you know, then, then you see that that would be very close. Um, but then they would say, but that doesn't necessarily correspond to, to actual earthquakes. So this, this whole idea of probabilistic forecasting of earthquakes, this, the sense that, you know, here's the likelihood of an earthquake within a certain period of a certain strength within a certain period of time is still 
um, a work in progress. And, and, and many seismologists and engineers have, have criticized these maps and suggested ways to make them better or more potentially useful. Because, I mean, ultimately, um, the idea is that this should be useful in some fashion. And so, for example, maybe in the, um, the creation of building codes or engineering uh, related uh, standards or something like that. So we'll come back to that uh, point. I just wanted to sort of introduce some of these, these things and sort of note that, that the, the inexactitude of, of some of the, the science here. Certain things about seismology are extremely exact and precise and other things, not so much. Um, so whatever the risks may be, let's just not worry too much about you know, getting just say that, that anywhere in Japan, except maybe in some of those areas that are, are um, yellow in color, but that's not very many areas. And even there, you know, that's I wouldn't. Yeah, you know, it's pretty much anywhere in Japan. Uh, there's a substantial uh, seismic risk. Some areas, perhaps more than others, but everywhere at least some. So, in, in concrete terms, how might this risk be mitigated? Um, and there, there tends to be two broad approaches to it. Um, so, all right, we can, we can measure things, measure earthquakes, catalog earthquakes, quantify some of that information, try to um, um, forecast where earthquakes are more likely to occur. You know, and so here with California, we've mapped out the faults extremely well. And uh, and here you know the, here's the 30 year magnitude 6.7 or greater uh, likelihood percent. It's the same probabilistic map that we just saw for Japan, but here's one for California. So we can we can um, uh, forecast earthquakes, or more precisely, what about predicting them? Uh, when the 2011 event occurred, uh, the guy who used to be in the next office to me. Uh, I forgot we were we were chatting about the earthquake in, in some fashion, and um, he said something to the effect. He asked me, "Well, you know, how 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 could this thing have just come along and surprised everybody so much? Seems like no one was prepared. Aren't we able to predict earthquakes?" You know, a lot of people think, you know, "Can't we predict earthquakes?" I mean, we can do all kinds of things, and as we'll see, as you probably know, the answer is no, we can't. Uh, and especially in any with any degree of usefulness. So, in other words, an, um, an earthquake of magnitude 6.7 is going to occur next week in, you know, this near in or near this city. If we could do something like that, that would be amazing. But we can't. So there's that approach: forecasting in a general, broad, vague way, like forecasting long-range weather patterns, or predicting with specificity. Uh, even the forecasting is very difficult. Prediction is impossible. And, uh, and then the other approach, of course, is to say seismic hazards are out there. Earthquakes are going to happen. Tsunamis are going to happen. We know, you know, at least, you know, in, in many ways where they're likely to happen. Let's prepare for them. Uh, let's put shock absorbers in our buildings, base isolation. Uh, here's some earthquake related, essentially shock. They look just like uh, old automobile shock absorbers. Uh, let's uh, make the built environment so that it's able to withstand the, uh, the and now here we're just, here's the risk part. The likely or reasonable or even maximum, although that then get, that gets ridiculously expensive. So yeah, close to, you know, whatever we can afford, you know, let's let's build the environment. Um, there's also some rather inex. This is fairly inex expensive, but there are things like you know just uh, identify uh, escape, you know, uh, uh, evacuation routes and which roads to take and have wide enough roads and places to evacuate. And of course, our friend the catfish. So if you ever see a catfish on a sign like this, you know that it's earthquake related in, in the context of Japan. Yeah. And that's, you know, I should probably address the catfish thing. Everyone always asks me about it. I'm so tired of it. I <laughs> talk about it, but um, you have written a, a lot about it and everything, but yeah, the, there was an idea, idea that 
to use the catfish, a huge giant catfish under the earth wiggling around as a metaphor for earthquakes. And this is actually common around the world, this, imagining some big animal under the ground, use some, a fish typically of some sort, a lizard, a dragon, something like that, uh, that wiggles around. Um, and there's actually a history of this. How did the catfish in Japan come to symbolize earthquakes? I've written about it in, um, um, at, at, at some length in, in one of my articles, but the, um, by 1855, when, the, when there's a big earthquake that shakes Edo in 1855, this idea is very well established. And so after the earthquake, we get all sorts of uh, woodblock prints featuring catfish. Um, and pe people even now sometimes say, well, um, that's because the people at the time believed that a wiggling catfish caused earthquakes. And I look, I've actually looked into this in considerable detail and I've seen little evidence of that. Uh, educated people don't seem to have thought that at all. <laughs> you know, they, they, um, it's certainly possible. You know, if suppose some, some, um, alien from you know some, some distant planet flies in and surveys the um, the visual landscape of of um, uh, of our world and says you know I'll, every year around the time of the winter solstice you get all these images of reindeer pulling a sleigh with this guy in it you know who's got this you know this kind of guy dressed in red distributing gifts yeah you know, these people thought that there was a sleigh that pulled through the sky by reindeer, and that they were so stupid. Or like, you know, everyone knows that's not the case. It's it's pretty much like that with the catfish. Uh, I'm sure some you know children and others believe that, but the typical adult does not seem to have thought that a catfish caused earthquakes. Instead, they thought that was a metaphor uh, for the shaking uh, of the earth. And then there were all sorts of of hypotheses and theories about what did cause uh, the shaking and in pre-modern times, like say the 19th century, it was almost always some sort of energy imbalance. It, was, it would typically be expressed in terms of a yin and yang energy imbalance. With yang energy, which is supposed to be up in the up, it's associated with the sun, so it's in the atmosphere, getting trapped within the earth in where it shouldn't be, building up and causing an explosive event. Um, that will then get changed in the 18. 56, seven and eight uh, to uh, the, a buildup of electricity. Very similar idea, it's just that it gets shifted from this vague idea of yang energy to a buildup of electricity, which is what was a popular idea in Europe at the time. So anyway, that I just wanted to, as long as the catfish is up here, I just wanted to mention that if you have any questions about catfish related earthquake lore, I'm sure I could answer them in excruciating detail if you want. Um, you know, in the Q and A, it's not really part of today's talk. But um, now, let's getting back to some terms here, and I, I don't mean to throw so many terms out out at you, but yet these are often misunderstood. So I just wanted to define them briefly. Earthquake intensity. It's just that we we choose this word intensity. It, um, it's almost it's somewhat of an arbitrary choice. That very specifically means the subjective feeling or experience of the earthquake from a human point of view. So from the point of view of lots of individual humans saying that you know, I couldn't stand up, the shaking was so so severe, or I felt the earthquake just a little bit, or books were falling off my bookshelf. That's what intensity is. It's the subjective perception. Right? And there are various scales for that. For example, the Mercal modified Mercalli scale. Uh, for intensity goes from one to 12 in this modified version. Sometimes there's a, up to 14 and, and so forth. I'll, I'll put that slide back up in a minute, but I just want to show you that's the, um, the subjective perception. Now, before we could measure anything like the, the, the release of energy from an earthquake with modern equipment, all we have to go on is intensity. So in terms of historical earthquakes from say the mid 19th century or, or earlier, we have to gather together all the accounts uh, that people had in describing it and try to very roughly estimate the magnitude from the intensity. All right, magnitude 
as you probably know, then is, is a different thing. It's related potentially, but it's the release of energy. How much energy did this earthquake release? That sudden release of energy that we talked about that defines an earthquake. Well, how much was it? Um, and the famous measure of magnitude is the Richter scale developed by Charles Richter in California in the 19th. 30s, rough for the most part, refined a little bit thereafter. And that gives us Richter magnitude, the Richter scale. Right? So we have five on the Richter scale, six on the Richter scale. I've already been using the terms magnitude, 6.7, things like that. And how would you actually calculate that? This is a really nice thing to do in, in the classroom. It's the perfect you know, kind of exercise. And it's it's really ba it's based on the seismogram that, that's generated. Uh, after an earthquake occurs, these the, you know today it's it's all digital, but these old-fashioned um, um, analog seismographs where the 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 pencil, where the stylus would actually write down on a piece of paper, uh, and you you have the primary waves, the secondary waves. You calculate the approximate distance based on the difference between those two in seconds, um, and then you look at the absolute value of the largest wave. It can be you know. You know, up or down, we just take take the largest one, and uh, in millimeters, the the amplitude, and literally the, what's written on the seismogram. Um, and then you can use a you can use a mathematical equation to to figure this out. But it's it's typically done using a chart that's already got it the, the laid out for you. You take that um, uh, amplitude, maximum in this case twenty three millimeters, and then you. Uh, you go down to the difference between the S minus P time, which is 24 seconds. Uh, and as that you, you draw that line, it's going to cross some point and you, that gives you your Richter magnitude. Right. And a Richter magnitude of five, this would be an earthquake that most of the time you could feel. In certain countries, like in parts of Iran or something, this could do tremendous damage. In Japan, it wouldn't do any damage you know, anywhere. It, it might shake some things off the table or something. Uh, but, you know, it, it, so that, that's also a factor is to what degree is a is a, a place built up for earthquakes. All right. <clears throat> and so let's just keep this Richter magnitude five in mind and look, consider that the Richter scale was made for California earthquakes, right? There's a transform faults, the ones that are sliding past each other. They're actually kind of both heading north, but one's going faster than the other. Um, those will not generate huge earthquakes. I mean, big, damaging in the sixes and occasionally into the sevens. Um, but they're going to uh, six, seven point five, which is a lot, but still that's that's way, you know, that's not anywhere close to a magnitude eight or nine event. And by the way, this is a logarithmic scale. Right. So, uh, you know, we're talking about 10 times more, you know, every time you go up. So there's a huge difference between a five and a six, a six and a seven. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so when you get up in the eights and the nines, the Richter scale doesn't work very well. It starts to, to, have, to, to, to not give you a really good, accurate measurement. It's great for the fours, fives and sixes, the stuff that you'll find in California. All right. So seismologists began in the 1960s to use seismic moment to measure the energy produced by an earthquake with precision. And it's uh, you, you basically multiply the shear modulus of the rock. That, OK, so that's the shear strength of the rock or the point at which the rock will break under uh, shear stress. Um, the area of rupture. So how much uh, uh, you know, of the earth has moved, has ruptured, and how far? The displacement, the average slip, um, and that gives you. Um, and of course, there's specific units, and there's some other, you know, some details about calculating this. But that's the the essence of it, um, and that gives you a very precise uh, measurement of earthquake energy release that geophysicists would find very satisfying. And then, okay, but then people would, but then newspaper reporters would say, well, what's that on the Richter scale? Well, it's not the Richter scale. Well, anyway, uh, in the late 1970s, uh, Hiro Kanomori, one of the famous seismologists, decided, all right, let's map seismic moment onto the Richter scale. 
I don't have the formula shown here, but you can you can Google for it. And if you if you're curious, this is a big, long, complicated formula, but it, it maps seismic moment onto the Richter scale, but it, it no it is no longer Richter magnitude, it becomes moment magnitude for obvious reasons. So and it's very precise. So moment magnitude uh it will give you a very precise gradation or comparison of the, the power, strength of earthquakes and there's no upper limit it just it can go up i mean the biggest one we've ever had is 9.5 in chile in 1960 but uh this thing you know it, it could just go up to 10 in, in principle um and so at the lower uh magnitudes like five the moment magnitude and the Richter magnitude are typically very close together or identical. Um, and in the sixes, they're very, very similar. Sevens, they're close. But once you get in the upper sevens and, and beyond, then they start to diverge uh, fairly significantly. And this will be important for Japan and for nuclear power plants and so forth. So it's not just uh, all these things have some relevance to what we're about to look at. Um, now, I, I want to put in these Japanese terms, Shindo. I can't tell you how many times people have translated Shindo as magnitude. And it's not magnitude. It's intensity. It's an intensity scale. All right? It's that intensity scale that you probably heard, you know, since most of you are living in Japan. The, it goes from one to seven, but there's a weak five and a strong five and a weak six and a strong six. Uh, and so it's actually got 10 units. And it's all and it's based on the subjective feel, right? So, um, and that's just you know, if you look at the word, the, literally the word, you think it means magnitude. It could mean that, but it, it's it's not. It doesn't mean that. It's intensity. And to say magnitude in Japanese, you have to say, oh, uh, the ma. There, there's some something missing here. I'm sorry, if the ma is missing. The magnitudo. It's always some error in my slides. Anyway, yeah, that's the that's the, or m, you know. Uh, and that's that would mean moment magnitude. Um, in today's world, you, you know, from the in 1980s on, all the magnitudes are going to be in moment magnitudes. Before that, they'd be in Richter magnitudes. Uh, ground motion uh, is those seismic waves that we mentioned at the very beginning, or some of you mentioned. Uh, and there are you know four different kinds. They and and ground, but let's just talk think about ground motion in terms of severity. It can be a you know a little bit of motion or a very severe motion. Um, so the intensity or the severity, typically people say severity of ground motion. And there are different ways you can quantify that and different units uh, to, to, to use for that. But one of the major seismic hazards is ground motion. Uh, you know, fairly obviously, but still it's just something to think about because. Um, a magnitude, a, a very high magnitude earthquake that occurs very deep in the earth might cause very little ground motion. A relatively less lower magnitude earthquake that occurs close to the surface, and especially in certain places where the ground might be unstable, could cause tremendous damage. Uh, so that's also a huge factor is the, the geological circumstances of the, you know, what kind of rock is there and also how deep the earthquake is. Many, some earthquakes are just so deep that they don't even matter, and they're just, you know, we, don't, we don't pay much attention to them. So depth, focus, focal depth, and hypocenter all mean the same thing, how deep the earthquake is. And the epicenter is the point at the surface of the earth, above, right above the earthquake. Um, and so the epicenter doesn't tell you about the depth, it tells you about the location on the surface of the earth. So these are all possible these are all relative, uh, relevant to seismic risk, as you can imagine. You know, how much magnitude, what magnitude was the earthquake? Uh, where was it? How deep was it? Uh, and other, other, what's the built, built environment like? And so forth. Yeah. Sorry about that. All right, now I mentioned the Richter magnitude versus moment magnitude. It turns out it's a pretty big deal regarding large earthquakes, okay? medium earthquakes, no problem, the two scales are the same. Um, and look at the difference in these examples, all right? Now notice that both scales are logarithmic and that's why you, you, you know, that's why you get these 5.62 times more energy, 7.08 and so forth. But 1952, Kamchatka, um, so right above Japan, you know, uh, um, in 
there's the MS is going to essentially means Richter magnitude. It's a little bit different, but but it's essentially Richter magnitude. That was clocked in in 1952 at 8.25. All right, so it's a class eight event, the low eights actually. All right, but in moment magnitude, it's a nine. So it's actually 5.6 times more energy than you would think from the 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 initial uh, magnitude from 1952. Same thing in 1957 in the Aleutian Islands, all right? So the other side of the Pacific, straight across, an 8.25 goes up to a 9.1, seven times more energy, all right? Um, <clears throat> the Chile earthquake was only an 8.3 in 1960. We now know is the biggest earthquake ever in terms of energy release, 9.5, 15, uh, almost 16 times more energy. So that earthquake sent a tsunami across the Pacific that did all kinds of damage in Japan. Uh, you know, that's how powerful it was. The 1964 Alaska earthquake, sometimes called the Good Friday earthquake, 8.4 in 1964 in Richter magnitude. That's all anyone was using. Um, uh, so you take that seismograph, you do the calculation, you get 8.4, but actually it's 9.2. Uh, six more than six times the the, the energy. So notice we're we're you know, all around the Pacific, Kamchatka, Aleutian Islands, Chile, Alaska. Now in 2004, it's only going to be a uh, moment magnitude. So we get a nine of, uh, magnitude nine event in the Indian Ocean, and then of course the Tohoku event 2011 was a nine. So if we had known back in the 1950s that there's a nine over here, a nine over there in 1960 in Chile, a nine over there in 64 Alaska. Um, you know, we would we know that there's a potential for magnitude nine class events, which are enormous. These are the, the ultimate in earthquakes um, uh, all around the Pacific. Um, and when was the uh, nuclear power industry standards established in Japan? Well, a little bit, some stuff was happening in the 1950s, but basically in the 1960s. Uh, so from the, from the standpoint of somebody who is very well versed in seismology and seismic, uh, you know, this, uh, seismic risk in the 1960s, even the 70s, early, mid 70s, um, uh, it would be perfectly reasonable to say a magnitude eight, lower eights is about the strongest we're ever going to get. Uh, let's engineer our nuclear power plants for that, you know, put some margin for error in there and uh, so forth. And so you get all power plants built in the 1960s that were engineered to standards that you know, were reasonable for the time, but we know much more now. We also know a lot more about paleo seismology, and we know that there were almost certainly magnitude nine events at different parts around the Pacific you know, way back in the past. Uh, and I argue in my 2014 book that a lot of this was known by the 1990s. Uh, and there were articles in journals, you know, talking about this sort of thing. Uh, so um, although what I just said here might suggest that I'm sort of saying, uh, well, we can't blame the 2011 nuclear disaster on the, the power plant industry because they, they, they didn't know. They knew by the 1990s. It's just that in the 1960s. They, they didn't know in the 1970s. So I do, I do criticize them fairly heavily uh, in, in my book. Um, now here are earthquakes between 1900 and 2017 of magnitude six or above. That's very uh, typical. I've already said, you know, that a lot of, uh, you know, uh, earthquake models are concerned only with sixes and above. Otherwise you just have just so much noise in your data. And of course, when it, with students in my class, my earthquake class, uh, we'll show them this uh, um, diagram and say, what patterns can you discern from this? And partly as an exercise, and constantly wanting them to think about patterns, patterns, you know, think like a scientist. Um, but of course, you know, people will notice, well, these, these, there's this big old ring here. Now, of course, if the Pacific Ocean were in the middle, then you have this nice ring right around it. Here, you have to splice it together from the two ends. Um, so they'll, they'll notice that Pacific Ocean so-called ring of fire. Um, and of course, here's the magnitude nine events. And so they fit 
with the Indian Ocean being a little bit of an exception, but they fit nicely around that ring. And then, you know, well, all right, can you tell where the te major tectonic plates are from these earthquake patterns? And indeed, if you, a little bit of training, you can, you can see you know, the outlines of many of the tectonic plates. Um, you can see, for example, that India, the Indian subcontinent is smashing up into uh, the Asian, the Eurasian continent. Um, and that's where you get this massive like pile up of earthquakes in Nepal and places like that. It's essentially India smashing up in there um, and just generating all sorts of earthquakes in, in the process. Uh, so, um, you know, there are a bunch of patterns that we can see. And once, I mean, th this sort of evidence, you know, just the visual evidence here on a map like this is you know, pretty strong evidence suggesting, wait a minute, something's going on in geographically circumscribed units, right? And so people were noticing that even before plate tectonics became widely accepted, and there's all sorts of other, other evidence that's going to lead to the acceptance of plate tectonics in most of the world by the late 1960s, in Japan, later, the mid to late 1970s. There's Someone's even written a book on why it took Japan so long to accept plate tectonics, but let's not worry about that. Uh, so when plate tectonics comes along, we finally have a really good theory of earthquakes um, that explains a lot of things. And it also caused a lot of enthusiasm in scientific communities and in, in the broader public that, well, maybe now we can start predicting earthquakes. So, um, so we'll just kind of keep that thought in mind as we, as we go along. And what about a tsunami? All right, so obviously that's a big deal uh, in Japan. Well, it turns out that oceanic uh, crust, you know, the crust of the earth with oceans above it, um, is when it meets continental crust is lighter and it's always subducts. It always goes underneath it. And that's what you see here in the bottom uh, diagram. This oceanic plate is subducting and is going beneath the continental plate. Notice that there is a, here it says, it calls it a blade boundary. There's this, looks like a blade boundary, a, a boundary where the two are, 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 are touching. And it's, you might think, well, one, it's just going to slide down. Uh, well, if that were the case, we wouldn't have to worry about uh, earthquakes or tsunamis in these subduction zones because if, if things keep moving, you don't have any buildup of energy, but they don't keep moving. Friction uh, locks this boundary here. All right, so that boundary is locked by friction most of the time. And so as this plate, like my arm is the plate, is moving at three centimeters a year in this direction, um, and this one, let's just say, is stable or is moving north and south, let's just say this, you know, it's going to build up. And that lock boundary is going to bend and deform the rock and deform the rock. And then eventually it'll burst forth and you'll have a catapult like effect. Uh, and you'll have um, a bunch of ocean water that gets displaced in both directions. Uh, and it will move out at about 500 miles an hour. So think of like the speed of a jet airliner uh, <clears throat> in both directions. And while it's moving through the ocean, uh, it's and here you see this A, B, C, D, the, the rupture, and then this, you know, uh, burst the the the, the uh, rebound of this plate, kind of elastic rebound uh, of this plate, displacing the water. Some of it goes out toward uh, out to sea. Some of it goes out to sea, but toward toward land, uh, toward nearby land. And while this wave is in in the deep ocean. You wouldn't even notice it hardly. You know, if a ship's out there in the ocean, it's maybe just, you know an inch or two of water goes past it. But as it approaches shore, it gets magnified and it rises. and And there are surges. There's a whole train of tsunami waves, and you get the effect that you see here. You've probably seen so many pictures of this from 2011. Uh, and you, there's videos where you can see the the tsunami waves coming in. Um, and tremendously powerful and destructive force, obviously. Uh, so that's a huge danger uh, in Japan and in certain other uh, parts of the world. You also have inland type earthquakes where the movement of tectonic plates, it doesn't just, even though okay, the vast majority of big earthquakes occur at plate boundaries, 
and especially at subduction zones. So here's some, you know, subducting plate boundaries. Um, the, uh, you, you do have inland earthquakes. Like why would there be an earthquake in Montana? Or you know, why would there be an earthquake up here in, in, in Russia or something like that, or in the middle of Africa, right? And so you have these intra-plate earthquakes um, and but those are ultimately the result of plate tectonics as well as these plates smash into each other, squeeze past each other, et cetera, that deforms rocks even far inland. There, there are some other factors as well. The, re uh, the rebound from retreating glacial ice sheets, but we're still actually experiencing the, the rebound from the previous ice age. It sounds weird, but that's but that's also plate tectonics. And this is the plate being you know moving up, being buckled, being twisted. That causes breaks in the rocks in, in, in inland areas called faults. And um, if the strain around a fault is still accumulating, it's an active fault. And so, uh, whereas if it's an old fault that no longer has strain accumulating around it, then it's considered inactive and could potentially become active in the future, uh, perhaps. Right. So I just wanted to get, get us all, you know, in, in on the same page with respect to earthquakes and tsunamis and things like that. Just pause here because I don't want to talk too fast. Take a drink of water. It's, it's hard because, you know, if this was a real room, I'd be able to gauge better, you know, if you're asleep or, or I'm, I'm going too fast or what. Well, so, we're about an hour into it. Maybe we could go to some QA. Um, again, we have this room until, what is it, 10 after 2? Um, okay. But maybe Oops. we can do some Q&A and then come back to other, I mean. Okay, can... maybe some Q&A about what we've done so far. Yeah, that, that might be a great, good idea to break things up. Sure. So, everyone, you have a built-in mic there. Everyone else is joining through Zoom. Please note that we are recording and archiving this, and we'll be uploading it to our institute website so if you show your face you know that'll be recorded as well if you prefer to remain anonymous you could write it into the chat room please indicate if you want to ask the question yourself or ask me or want me to ask it for you so while you're doing that um Greg, I, I have a question um you talked about the the whole the idea of like animals like the catfish being used metaphorically. Um, and yet I've seen artwork dating back perhaps centuries. Is it possible that in an early era that was there was a more literal association there? Or do you think it's always been metaphoric and symbolic? It's possible that earlier it was um, more literal, although in Japan um, we don't get the catfish being associated with earthquakes until the late 1500s. All right, the first, perhaps the earliest recorded instance of it is Toyotome Hideyoshi talking about a catfish event and referring to an earthquake. Um, and 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 it's not it's, and that's actually important because he's based in the Lake Biwa area, and geographically that seems to be the place where the association between catfish and earthquakes occurred was in Lake Biwa. Uh, which has some very large catfish in it. Uh, and then that in, uh, so, so 1590s, and then in the 17th and 18th century, the, the idea gradually uh, goes from there. Um, did Hideyoshi think that cat, a catfish caused earthquakes? We don't know, you know but, but it, that's about as early as, as it gets in terms of uh, uh, the link between uh, catfish and earthquakes in Japan. Uh, so it's it's roughly of early 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 modern vintage. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, so you were talking about seismic risk and and being able to to look at that through like historical uh, accounts and where you have a lot of uh, plate boundaries and or or where you're closer to plate boundaries and such. But um, there's been a like recently uh there's been a there's been a lot of um earthquakes although a lot smaller in nature that have been happening uh on uh very far away from from historical uh places where there have been earthquakes due to uh 
uh, new uh, types of technology, such as things like fracking or uh, injecting wastewater um, into the ground. So do you think that there is needs to be a like a, almost like relooking at what at uh, the management of seismic risk of looking at seismic risk in areas that have been industrialized and have these practices going on or, or yeah, that is that is my question. Yeah, and almost by definition, if so, if fracking or any other process is causing earthquakes, which is certainly you know happening, um, then uh, and and we have such good coverage of the world in terms of uh, seismographic ability, you know, to you know to measure these things, we measure them instantly, uh, and um, <clears throat> so uh, insofar as these earthquakes become a you know. The, the, they're often just a nuisance because they're not that strong, but insofar as they're more than a nuisance, or even if they're a nuisance, that's one thing. But uh, yeah, sir, I mean, potentially this could be a real problem. Uh, so far, is it? It's a, it's a minor problem. It's it's it, and it it's helped in some ways for us to better understand some of the mechanics of uh, of earthquakes and, and ground motion and things like that. But yeah, obviously, if uh, insofar as any industrial process or uh, mining process or whatever uh, has the potential to create earthquakes, um, you know, then it, it it creates seismic hazards, at least potential seismic hazards. And and uh, uh, if any of those earthquakes ever become you know serious or potentially deadly or destructive, uh, obviously that we you know, we have to address that or we should address it. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is a new and emerging area and very important. I'm not talking about it that much. Uh, you know, in, in fact, I'm not talking about it at all, but but it's not because I, I don't think it's uh, important. Thank you very much. All right. Well, why don't we just, with this, I didn't realize it. Go ahead, Luke. I was wondering, like, when we were looking at all of those old earthquakes, the, like the one that happened in Chile, like how, how do we know that they were higher? Did we just look at physical data from the time or? Like Let me flip back to that. Uh, no, we, it's because we have the, we have the seismographic record. I mean, so in other words, we've got really good instrumental data, even in the 1950s, you know, we, and by the 1960s, you know, we've, we've got really good instrumental data. And so we can, just recalculate there. I mean, it's not that easy, but, but it's, uh, it's sort of like, you know, in a crime, you know, crime, an old crime that's happened 20 years ago and there's data, there's evidence in the evidence room and we can reanalyze it using DNA or something. It's, it's, it's that sort of a thing where there, there's definitely enough data, uh, that it's not, we don't have to rely like on written records or something like that. It's, it's all, you know, pretty hardcore scientific data. Greg, I have a question with regard to predictability. You, you made a distinction between prediction and forecasting. Um, you know the notion of, of what are called black swans? Um, so that's a black swan being a, a, an extreme unpredicted event that cannot be anticipated. And yet, in retrospect, people try to make sense of it by thinking it was all too obvious. Although, before it happens, people don't think that way. So I was thinking about this with regard to something like the gambler's fallacy. Um, David Satterwhite is in on this chat. And we've taken groups of students up to the Daiichi Nuclear Park for a number of times. And every time we've gone, I've noticed that they don't have a tsunami seawall. I mean, now that the earthquake and the tsunami has come in, they put kind of a kind of containment wall right around the reactors, but a proper tsunami seawall that existed before. There was that 11 meters, that's not there. And every time we'd go up, I would ask them, what's up with the seawall? One time they said, we have determined that tsunamis come from the south. They might as well have said it comes from the west. But I wonder, is there some sort of psychology of like a gambler's fallacy that a person who's been pre-disaster and therefore you don't have to worry about it for another 70 years? Is that a wholly irrational deduction? 
No, we find that kind of psychology at work in um, a number of uh, situations. Uh, I'm, I had a little bit of a hard time hearing you, so I missed a few things you said. But, but um, like, for example, when the Meiji uh, Sanbiku tsunami, which was, you know, killed almost 20,000 people, uh, when that occurred, and that was 1896, and I'm, uh, I'm going to, I'll, I'll show, you know, I've, I've got some information, all these things uh, coming up. Um, when that occurred, a, a lot of people said, well, all right, that was horrible. That was terrible. But the last one was in 16, oh, I forgot now, 1611. Last one was in 1611. So we're good, you know, and, and within 10 years, people were moving back into coastal communities and so forth. And then in 1933, another one comes along in exactly the same area. Now, geologically, it was a different mechanism. It was this, see this thing here, an earthquake occurring within the plate, um, that the subducting plate just before it gets to this blade boundary. Um, so, but it's essentially the same thing. It generates a huge tsunami. And, and, and uh, so practically speaking, it's the same thing and, and people, Okay. Whoa, that we just had one in 1896, and, and now we had another one in 1932. Well, I guess we better be prepared. All right. So then, so that's one manifestation of that. And so, okay, so let's get prepared. And so, uh, the people of the town of Taro, which is quite famous example that you know many people have, have talked about, said, and we're going to build the biggest, baddest seawall that's ever been made. Uh, and they built and built and built and at you know over many, many years because the war intervenes and there's you know not much funds and everything. By the time the Chile earthquake in 1960 throws off a tsunami, it hits that great wall of Taro, as it came to be called, and no problem. Just way bounced off that thing and and people were impressed. There were people from all over the world would come and see this great wall as an example of what to do. The town of Taro even issued a tsunami, essentially a kind of like a, this weird declaration where they basically thumbed their nose at nature. So this is a tsunami proof city. Uh, and it was on the anniversary of the 1933 event. Um, and then 2011, whole thing wiped out. Uh, is it overtopped? If they built it a couple of meters higher, higher maybe it would have worked. But uh, uh, you know, it's because they were they weren't anticipating a, a possibility of a magnitude nine event. Uh, so this kind of psychology is at work uh, uh, all over the place. Yes. From your point of view, is that entirely irrational? Is there? I mean, I know there's a psychological logic to it, but scientifically, is that absurd? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure, you know, it's literally really hard to draw. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I mean, the way our brains work isn't, you know, it isn't rational. It never, I mean, in so many different ways. Uh, we, we're, because we we are first and foremost emotional creatures. Um, and this has been borne out in so many different kind of fields of, uh, of endeavor. So in a sense, one thing we need to do is to always resist our psychological urges and one of the things that i found in studying uh, the history of seismology in japan especially the modern history was there was this intense desire which is scientific in a sense to find patterns um but people were looking all over the place for patterns and very often that especially what what they wanted was for earthquakes to follow patterns that were well established in human society so the sexagenary cycle Wait a minute. What if earthquakes occur every sixty years? You know, and you mentioned seventy. You know, this is kind of close. You know, and and so you get all this lore about sexagenary cycles. And on the sixtieth anniversary of some of the big earthquakes, like on say Edo, people would really get nervous, and the newspapers would all be reporting on it. And that's just one of many examples of this desire to get the to, to have the Earth and its clocks or its rhythms sync with something in human society. And so far, that's just never been, um, uh, you know, that that, that 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 never works. And if you ever get thinking in those ways, it's going to lead to problems. Yeah, I, one takeaway that I got from your writing was that we cannot predict earthquakes. So therefore, maybe it's not a great idea to build earthquakes on 
one of the most seismically active or build nuclear power plants on one of the most seismically active areas in the world. Right, right. Um, now, if I can just kind of segue into that, here's the the plate situation for Japan. And notice that you've got a subducting plate, the Pacific in this case, subducting under the Philippine Sea Plate, which is subducting under the Eurasian Plate. Uh, so you have a, it's almost a double subduction zone. But when you look at these, you have the North American Plate that's actually coming way over from, you know, uh, Pacific Plate, uh, Philippine Sea and the Eurasian Plate. Some people will divide the Eurasian into more than one, but let's just keep. So the Japanese islands, are being pushed and pulled and squeezed and twisted, um, you know, in, in every which way. And there you get well over 250 known active faults, which are in this on the right, it's illustrated with these red uh, little lines. Um, and here you see a close up. Um, <clears throat> and uh, and there more are found all the time. And if you look at the newspapers, it's constantly. Ah, an active fault's been found over here, which we didn't know about. The, the Kobe earthquake in 1995 was on a fault that had not been previously known to exist. So often we know about them when an earthquake happens. So yeah, so uh, Kyle, you're, you're suggesting that um, given this situation here, we just shouldn't build nuclear power plants in Japan. Is that... Could, well, is I, don't that know a, I, I don't know if I'd go that far. I mean, there's a question okay. of where you might build them. I would think okay. Idaho, for instance, where you have a, a huge landmass. The yeah. problem is almost virtually every nuclear power plant is built on a body of water. And so in Japan, that means on the coast, and you have a country that is 1 34th the landmass of the United States, had 54 nuclear reactors. Um, so obviously, there's been a reconsideration of all of that. Um, yeah. We have another question here from one of our students, Justin. Lower, yeah, right there. Um, I actually had a question on um, the moment magnitude and the equation there with shear modulus. Um, yes. I don't know like too much about, I guess, soil science, but is there like a big enough difference in um, like the shear modulus of different plates around the world where some areas are more prone to higher magnitude earthquakes? Yeah, that's a good question, and it's one that I uh, can't definitively answer because I just don't have the uh, the knowledge in that realm. When I've done calculations, you know, we, what we usually do is we use the same shear modulus for everything all, all around the world. In other words, a lot of the rock is close, and it's not you know it's actually they all have a little bit different, but it's just a little bit different. So we just to make things simple in class, we always use the same value. And it's close. Um, so, um, is there some are there some places around the world where, where the difference is big and significant? That's a great question, and unfortunately, I don't know. I will be asking somebody about that. Uh, uh, so, I wish I could give you more information, but I, I just don't know. That was a great technical question for the engineering school. So, I think we have a couple of other. Go ahead, Ben. Hey, Greg, my question is pretty simple. On the slide that you had that showed all the different uh, uh, magnitude six earthquakes and above across mm -hmm. the world. Right, okay. Showing, uh, yeah. You mentioned that showing anything uh, beneath that would just clutter it up too much, but is there mm -hmm. any to like studying and tracking the smaller size earthquakes? Do they provide any type of like insight that would help or is it only the larger scale ones? Some some seismologists actually specialize in small earthquakes, and they they uh, their argument is that even though they don't matter in a practical sense, like they're not going to destroy a building or something, that they because of their they're small and they're frequent, uh, that they provide an opportunity for us to to try to understand better the mechanics of earthquakes, which we we don't really understand the the mechanics very well. What actually is happening down there in the earth when the fault ruptures? So yes, the small ones can be useful. Uh, um, although I can't say much more than that because you know I've, I've actually talked to some of these seismologists who work on small ones and have you know chatted with them a little bit about that, but I don't. I've never really looked into that myself. So 
Yeah, I mean, we would fill up this whole thing with, but but of course, what you can do is then filter out the big ones. There's all kinds of ways to make maps of the small ones, and 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 uh, uh, so yeah, there are people who work on them. I think we do have a question. So I have a question about four shocks. So you're talking about four shocks earlier. Um, I have kind of it splits into two questions so one is there a certain like size that a foreshock has to be within to be considered a foreshock and also can they cause like um a snowball effect of earthquakes yes uh yes and yes um or, i'm sorry no for the first question is there a certain size that it has to be uh any size can be a foreshock in retrospect uh and um, so, but as a, as a practical precursor to an earthquake, in other words, something that, you know, might, might potentially be useful, although it's actually not useful because we don't, we cannot know if something is a foreshock until afterward, um, the, it, it has to be strong enough to be felt. Like if we were going to just say, whoa, an earthquake just happened, that might be a foreshock you know, that it would have to be felt, but the, technically there's no, no uh, size. Um, <clears throat> and then is it possible for there to be a snowball effect? Some seismologists think that there are certain earthquake sequences where in fact, that's the case. Uh, or, you know, let's say the fault slips a bit and then a bit more and then a, then a bit more. And one of the, historically, one of the best examples um, is here along the Nankai trough, uh, the um in which there's the uh nonkai there in 1853 a big part of the nonkai trough ruptured on one day and then the next day the rest of it ruptured uh, so there's an and and so there's an example of a, of a not exactly a snowball effect but a kind of a rupture and then and then the rest of it goes uh so uh, uh, yes, uh, four shocks can snowball into this, the biggest one, which would be called considered the main shock again in retrospect, uh, or they can have other kinds of effects where, you know, you would have two that are almost a, a roughly equal degree, but over a different area. We have another question. Hi, Greg. Um, I'm doing a presentation on the 1906 San Francisco earthquake in a couple of days. Um, and I'm kind of just curious about, you talk about, you talked about it a little bit today, but in the article that we were sent in preparation for this, you talk about this idea of um, like historical memory and that as time goes on, people's, I guess, sensitivity to the risk of like a large scale seismic event generally decreases mm -hmm. um and this is definitely i think true in california now where something like probably 70 or 80 percent of people don't have earthquake insurance despite the fact that um we haven't had an earthquake since like 89 i think so i'm just kind of curious um how you think that pertains to mm -hmm. the future of like earthquake preparedness in california and i guess also japan moving forward from 2011 yeah um let me yeah try to go through some of my slides here so i've got so much stuff um which will partly answer that question and the 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 basic answer both in california and japan is that the built environment is so much better now um now of course if you buy an old brick house or something that's you might want to get insurance on that um but my i, I have a close colleague here at penn state who I work with on earthquakes who's a seismologist and he lived in California for a while and he did the calculations for earthquake insurance and said it's not worth it uh you know so he was completely confident in turning it down that was based on where he lived and in what kind of a house and all, all sorts of things but um yeah if if another earthquake of that's almost the same. Of course, they're never the same. But if something like roughly the same as what happened in 1906 were to hit today, it would still cause a lot of problems in the San Francisco area. Uh, but it would not be nearly as 
uh, you know, probably. Because part, part of the, there's all these unknown variables when you have a comp, you know, human societies are complex. I'm just going to say probably, but we have so much better uh, uh, of, a, of, a, of a built environment now. And it was so bad in 1906 because that was a, a legacy of the, of the gold rush years in California. So buildings were put together, which even by the standards of 1906 were shoddy construction. Um, and the, the water mains, you know, were, you know, to, to now the water system is all uh, secured against earthquakes, the bridges, the roads, etc. cetera. Um, and the, the 1989 event really helped to, to push, you know, the, the, the standards up. So I would think that um, it is true that, you know, people's historical memory fades, and that can be a big problem, but probably not so much in California and not necessarily so much in Japan either, where there's been so much uh, improvement uh, since the 1980s in, in building uh, design. And the Kobe earthquake really showed that. Um, you could almost see what parts of Kobe were, were built under which building codes of which era, just based on, on the destruction patterns with the, those uh, parts of the city built from approximately, I, th I think the year was 1981, revision and building codes, you know, all did relatively well. Go ahead, if you could help them with that. We have another question. Uh, my name is Humi Harukaga, and I'm I've been living in, in Japan and in this area for 67 years. And unfortunately, this year is a 100 year anniversary. I welcome an anniversary after the uh, Great Kanto earthquake. And as you said, that uh, we have a revision of the building code in 1981 and also 2000. And 1981 uh, revision of the code is. Uh, 1978 Miyagi Prefecture earthquake, which is uh, almost the same area as uh, 2011 uh, earthquake. Yes. And also the, the 2000 was uh, a change of the 2000 year. 2000 uh, building code is uh, after the Kobe earthquake, the 1995. Uh, so we tend to, the, we, uh, I think it's the way human being is, uh, Tend of the, the creature tend to forget the thing. So we ha we think it's uh, I, I think it's uh, we have to uh, trans transmit or inherit all the the memory to the other generations. Otherwise, we we can tend to forget the, the oh, and also the cannot uh, prepare for the future a disaster. Uh, do, do you think uh, you do you think that this is uh, the way we have to think? Uh, yes, uh, I, of course. I work on having worked on the um, you know history of earthquakes. Uh, you know, that's uh, I, uh, I can't help but think that this is um, it, you know somewhat important for uh, uh, contemporary people as well. Um, I, I would just say though that there, there's kind of a, a balance that, in other words, we're better prepared to deal with earthquakes today than ever before in the past, especially in countries like Japan or the parts of the United States that typically have earthquakes or other parts of the world that frequently have earthquakes. I mean, except, you know, we see like, we saw one recently in Turkey, for example, it did a lot of damage and it wasn't that terribly big. Well, Turkey doesn't have, is not as well off in terms of its built environment as say Japan is. So yeah, on the one hand, we should be aware very much aware of the possibility of damaging earthquakes and especially those big ones, the tsunamigenic earthquakes that occur along the entire coast. Um, uh, and, and I think people are aware in the sense that there are monuments all over the place, there are markers, this is how high the water got. Uh, on the other hand, we saw in the case of Taro, now this was you know, years ago, starting in 1933, but still, you know, the people do have a tendency to become complacent and arrogant and over reliant on on technology, um, but so it's it's kind of a balance. I, on the one hand, we're better off today than we ever have been before. On the other hand, certainly yes, uh, we we need to all be aware of 
you know, realistic seismic hazards uh, that, that could occur, that happen at any time. And pretty much anywhere in Japan is, is subject to seismic hazards. Greg, we are at an hour and a half and perhaps we should be wrapping it up, but I have a question before we go. And I also wanna call out to students. It looks like we might have one or two other questions. Based upon your expertise and having studied this so closely, do you think that TEPCO should be held criminally liable for their disaster mitigation and preparations and not having a sufficient seawall with the tsunami and the frequency of these earthquakes in mind? Um, I, whether they should be held criminally uh, liable is sort of a legal question that I've never really thought about. You know, so I don't want to, uh, if I just would take that word out and, and just say, should they have known? Right? And then you can legal, make whatever legal case based on that. My argument in, in my 2014 book is yes, uh, that if, if this event had occurred in the 1970s, then the, the, you know, the, the, the sote guy, you know, beyond the imagination, act of God kind of um, argument would have been legitimate, I think. If it had occurred even in 19, the 1990s, arguably maybe, but um, by the early 1990s, uh, there was plenty of evidence that magnitude nine class events were possible. And, that, and, and, and then as we get later into the late 90s and early uh, part of the 20th century, there's even discussion among TEPCO executives and uh, the, you know, the, the, we have, we have you know, uh, records of discussions in the diet and, and elsewhere where people are warning that, um, s that the older nuclear power plants aren't, uh, aren't adequate. And you know, of course the, Fukuichi, uh, uh, the, the, the Fukushima Daiichi plant was actually slated to be you know, taken offline and, 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 and put into mothballs precisely because it was not adequate. Um, uh, a more recently built plant would have been able to handle, you know, that that event uh, well. And in fact, the um, the Daiichi plant actually did remarkably well in terms of holding together, even though uh, the shaking exceeded its its official specifications. The problem was that that seawall wasn't high enough. The wave overtopped it, and it knocked out the the cooling system. So. Um, but yeah, they should have, TEPCO should have known and argue, I think there's a good argument argument to be made that they should have acted faster and more decisively instead of just kind of slowly winding down the problematic plants. Okay, so we have two more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Um, Hunter, do you wanna do it? One, one thing, one question. Okay, yeah. Uh, Riga, uh, 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 for the, the, the type of Fukushima Daiichi, they just uh, placed a diesel engine generator in the underneath of the ground, and it's a kind of uh, absurd to, to because the people think it's, it's submerged in in the, in the water, even in the within the uh, not not the, the torrential rain can make it uh, submerged in the, in the underneath. So, what do you think about this this? Uh, Emergency electricity supply for the with a diesel engine, which was designed in 1970s by Westinghouse, and they haven't changed it since the, the, the first construction of the Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, I have you. Yeah, clearly it was inadequate. I mean, uh, for reasons that you just mentioned, if uh, the wave overtops the seawall, which it did, uh, then if the 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 diesel engines are located, you know, deep in the ground. I'm sure there was some re good reason for that in terms of fuel efficiency or easy, whatever. But yeah, it, it clearly was inadequate, you know, quite obviously. And, uh, and and TEPCO knew that it wasn't up to standards, and that's why you know it was, it, it was going to uh, wind down that plant. But you know, arguably that should have happened much sooner. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I think it was, it, obviously there's there's some real serious design flaws in the um, uh, not only the seawall but uh, also some some other uh, features like the 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 height of of the diesel generators. <laughs>
If I could um, echo on that and just speak to that for a moment. I've done interviews with people on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission about this issue. And they say that actually it's fairly common practice to, to put diesel generators in those kind of locations. But it seems that the issue is not that per se, but rather if you don't think an accident's gonna happen, you don't prepare for it. And in the aftermath, everything kind of snaps into focus and it seems also obvious. But apparently when they did their probabilistic risk analysis, they had calculated that there would not be a tsunami at that magnitude in that location. And um, obviously they miscalculated. But I mean, ultimately what they've done now um, is they're building, they are putting backup generators up on the hill. At the Daiichi plant, they had carved the, what was kind of a natural seawall from previous tsunamis in the ocean down from 38 meters down to the ocean level. That was to save money. And so, you know, in the, in the aftermath of all that, that seems a very poor risk analysis. We have one last question by Hunter. Yeah, just kind of a continuation of what Kyle was saying. If you, if you don't think a disaster is going to happen, you don't prepare for it. And I, you talk a little bit about this in the article that we read as well, but um, just the idea that these events are often treated as freak accidents when if you look at the pattern of seismic activity in Japan or in California, or I guess another example would be wildfires in California, these events are extremely normal. And I mean, I feel like to properly prepare for disasters like that, you have to kind of accept that these kind of events are not only common, but inevitable challenges you're going to have to face. And I feel like often when countries have poor disaster responses, it feels like these were either seen as kind of like put on the back burner as like something that could happen maybe, or um, just that weren't properly prepared for. So I'm curious how you think Japan, especially Japan, I guess, but also other places around the world kind of view modern disaster response and if it's any different than it was in 2011. Yeah, well, I don't, you know, keep, I don't keep up with all the, the, the latest details, you know, about you know, what might have been done, but, but as, you know, Kyle just mentioned, for example, now we put the new the the diesel generators up high, um, you know. There's so with every disaster, people learn you know lessons from it, and and certainly especially modern ones, which are so carefully studied and assessed, and you know there there's blame, you know, is assessed and and you know, etc. Um, and the cyclical nature, in other words, the inevitability of these disasters is is also well known, at least in for people in Japan, who, especially those who live along the coast and so forth. And, you know, just if you just took it, look at the place where the 2011 disaster hit, there's this massive uh, tsunami in 1896, another massive one, a little bit, not quite as bad, but almost in 1933, and then 2011. But before that, there's, you know, there's one in six, a big one in 1611, some smaller but noticeable ones in the 1850s. Uh, and now we have evidence, paleo seismological evidence that that indicates that there were uh, major, probably, you know, close to a magnitude nine event, but, you know, similarly severe tsunamis uh, that have happened at several times in the distant past. Um, and all this was known by 19, the 1990s, uh, you know, in, in academic circles, at least. Uh, so one one distinction is to make is is who knows what among experts among the people who are supposed to be in charge of ensuring say, for safety regulations among the engineering community, etc. You know the the general population is obviously going to be much less aware of a lot of these the, these kinds of details and to to sort of insist that the average person just be all worried about the possibility of a disaster is is you know surely unrealistic right. Um, so, um, uh, you know, that there's also that, that matter of, of, you know, which segment of society are, are, are we talking about? Um, but yeah, uh, the, you know, the, the, we have this, you know, there's an ideal 
when you look at airline accidents, for example, it's the same thing where there's all these safety systems in place, which if they all work right, no problem. If even a few of them work, no problem. But it's almost like you take Swiss cheese and several slices, and sometimes the whole lines up and you have this, this uh, some, you know, a crash that should never have happened. Uh, most crashes are like that. You know, it should never have happened. Um, and so, you know, these uh, earthquake disasters or other kinds of, of natural disasters are similar. If everybody is on the ball, if everybody is, is you know, up to code and the experts are thinking, at, uh, you know, at proactively about what might happen and government is responding, you know, by up dating safety regulations as needed you know in this idealistic world yeah we would we would suffer much less uh from uh, but then we have the human psychology factor that you know that kyle mentioned a few times and that that's very very important uh where we tend to get complacent and uh yeah we, you know, and it's, it's it's almost like there's this constant battle with complacency that we need to wage Greg, thank you so much. This has been fascinating and very informative. Appreciate you taking the time. What is it? 12.30 in the morning there? Uh, something like that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, now that I'm, I'm all hyped up about this topic, I could keep going for hours. But <laughs> a real trooper on this. So I'll be in touch with you by email. And everyone, okay. thank to you all for your attention to all this. Yeah, I really appreciate uh, it. superb content. And I guess, I, uh, again, I want to give a shout out to the books by Greg, um, When the Earth Roars and Seismic Japan, or is that the? Seismic Japan, yeah. yeah. And there's a bunch of others about the Ry Ryukyu Islands, if you're interested in that region, uh, not about disasters, just, you know, so, yeah. Uh, while we're on the topic, aside from your own work, is there any you know, must reads that you recommend on earthquakes, either more broadly or in Japan? Um, the, the, the best place for that is in my bibliography. And uh, that's, and, and, and I haven't been keeping up too much with the latest literature because I've been working almost entirely on the Ryukyu Islands the last 10 years or so. So I'm about 10 years out of date in terms of, there, there's probably a bunch of great stuff that's come out in the last 10 years, both in English and Japanese, but I'm just not up to date with it. Well, you have 60 more years, Greg, before you got to worry about it. All right. <laughs> I'll come back to this topic at some point, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, well, thank you so much. So we're going to sign out for now. Everyone, this will be archived and made available in a week or two. If you go to Temple University of Japan's Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies website, you'll see this lecture and more. So thanks again, Greg. Really appreciate it.